Section 9 of A Journal of the Plague Year by Daniel Defoe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Dennis Sayers. Section 9. I could not perceive that my discourse made much impression upon them all that while, till it happened that there came two men of the neighborhood, hearing of the disturbance, and knowing my brother, for they had been both dependents upon his family, and they came to my assistance. These being, as I said, neighbors, presently knew three of the women, and told me who they were and where they lived, and it seems they had given me a true account of themselves before. This brings these two men to a further remembrance. The name of one was John Hayward, who was at that time under sexton of the parish of St. Stephen, Coleman Street. By under sexton was understood at that time grave-digger and bearer of the dead. This man carried, or assisted to carry, all the dead to their graves, which were buried in that large parish, and who were carried in form. And after that form of burying was stopped, went with the dead cart and the bell to fetch the dead bodies from the houses where they lay, and fetched many of them out of the chambers and houses. For the parish was, and is still, remarkable, particularly, among all the parishes in London, for a great number of alleys and thoroughfares, very long, into which no carts could come, and where they were obliged to go and fetch the bodies a very long way, which alleys now remain to witness it, such as White's Alley, Cross Key Court, Swan Alley, Bell Alley, White Horse Alley, and many more. Here they went with a kind of hand-barrow, and laid the dead bodies on it, and carried them out to the carts, which work he performed, and never had the distemper at all, but lived about twenty years after it, and was sexton of the parish to the time of his death. His wife at the same time was a nurse to infected people, and tended many that died in the parish, being, for her honesty, recommended by the parish officers. Yet she never was infected, neither. He never used any preservative against the infection, other than holding garlic and rue in his mouth, and smoking tobacco. This I also had from his own mouth. And his wife's remedy was washing her head in vinegar, and sprinkling her head-clothes so with vinegar as to keep them always moist, and if the smell of any of those she waited on was more than ordinary offensive, she snuffed vinegar up her nose, and sprinkled vinegar upon her head-clothes, and held a handkerchief wetted with vinegar to her mouth. It must be confessed that, though the plague was chiefly among the poor, yet were the poor the most venturous and fearless of it, and went about their employment with a sort of brutal courage. I must call it so, for it was founded neither on religion nor prudence. Scarce did they use any caution, but ran into any business which they could get employment in, though it was the most hazardous. Such was that of tending the sick, watching houses shut up, carrying infected persons to the pest-house, and, which was still worse, carrying the dead away to their graves. It was under this John Hayward's care, and within his bounds, that the story of the piper, with which people have made themselves so merry, happened, and he assured me that it was true. It is said that it was a blind piper, but, as John told me, the fellow was not blind, but an ignorant, weak, poor man, and usually walked his rounds about ten o'clock at night, and went piping along from door to door, and the people usually took him in at public houses where they knew him, and would give him drink and victuals, and sometimes farthings, and he, in return, would pipe and sing and 
talk simply, which diverted the people, and thus he lived. It was but a very bad time for this diversion, while things were, as I have told. Yet the poor fellow went about as usual, but was almost starved, and when anybody asked how he did, he would answer, the dead cart had not taken him yet, but that they had promised to call for him next week. It happened one night that this poor fellow, whether somebody had given him too much drink or no, John Hayward said he had not drink in his house, but that they had given him a little more victuals than ordinary at a public house in Coleman Street, and the poor fellow, having not usually had a bellyful for perhaps not a good while, was laid all along upon the top of a bulk or stall, and fast asleep, at a door in the street near London Wall, towards Cripplegate, and that upon the same bulk or stall the people of some house, in the alley of which the house was a corner, hearing a bell which they always rang before the cart came, had laid a body really dead of the plague just by him, thinking, too, that this poor fellow had been a dead body, as the other was, and laid there by some of the neighbors. Accordingly, when John Hayward, with his bell, and the cart came along, finding two dead bodies lie upon the stall, they took them up with the instrument they used, and threw them into the cart, and all this while the piper slept soundly. From hence they passed along and took in other dead bodies, till, as honest John Hayward told me, they almost buried him alive in the cart. Yet all this while he slept soundly. At length, the cart came to the place where the bodies were to be thrown into the ground, which, as I do remember, was at Mount Mill, and, as the cart usually stopped some time before they were ready to shoot out the melancholy load they had in it, as soon as the cart stopped, the fellow awaked, and struggled a little to get his head out from among the dead bodies, when, raising himself up in the cart, he called out, Hey, where am I? This frighted the fellow that attended about the work, but after some pause John Hayward, recovering himself, said, Lord bless us, there's somebody in the cart not quite dead. So another called to him, and said, Who are you? The fellow answered, I am the poor piper. Where am I? Where are you? says Hayward. Why, you are in the dead cart, and we are going to bury you. But I ain't dead, though, am I? says the piper, which made them laugh a little, though, as John said, they were hardly frighted at first. So they helped the poor fellow down, and he went about his business. I know the story goes. He set up his pipes in the cart, and frighted the bearers and others so that they ran away. But John Hayward did not tell the story so, nor say anything of his piping at all, but that he was a poor piper, and that he was carried away as above, I am fully satisfied of the truth of. It is to be noted here that the dead carts in the city were not confined to particular parishes, but one cart went through several parishes, according as the number of dead presented nor were they tied to carry the dead to their respective parishes, but many of the dead taken up in the city were carried to the burying-ground in the out-parts for want of room. I have already mentioned the surprise that this judgment was at first among the people. I must be allowed to give some of my observations on the more serious and religious part. Surely, never city at least of this bulk and magnitude, was taken in a condition so perfectly unprepared for such a dreadful visitation, whether I am to speak of the civil preparations or religious. They were, indeed, as if they had had no warning, no expectation, no apprehensions, and, consequently, 
the least provision imaginable was made for it in a public way. For example, the Lord Mayor and Sheriffs had made no provision as magistrates for the regulations which were to be observed. They had gone into no measures for relief of the poor. The citizens had no public magazines or storehouses for corn or meal for the subsistence of the poor, which, if they had provided themselves, as in such cases is done abroad, many miserable families who are now reduced to the utmost distress would have been relieved, and that in a better manner than now could be done. The stock of the city's money I can say but little to. The Chamber of London was said to be exceedingly rich, and it may be concluded that they were so, by the vast of money issued from thence in the rebuilding the public edifices after the fire of London, and in building new works, such as, for the first part, the Guild Hall, Blackwell Hall, part of Leaden Hall, half the Exchange, the Session House, the Compter, the Prisons of Ludgate, Newgate, and etc. Several of the wharves and stairs and landing places on the river, all which were either burned down or damaged by the great fire of London the next year after the plague. And of the second sort, the monument, Fleet Ditch, with its bridges, and the hospital of Bethlehem, or Bedlam, etc., but possibly the managers of the city's credit at that time made more conscience of breaking in upon the orphans' money to show charity to the distressed citizens than the managers in the following years did to beautify the city and re-edify the buildings, though in the first case the losers would have thought their fortunes better bestowed, and the public faith of the city have been less subjected to scandal and reproach. It must be acknowledged that the absent citizens, who, though they were fled for safety into the country, were yet greatly interested in the welfare of those whom they left behind, forgot not to contribute liberally to the relief of the poor, and large sums were also collected among trading towns in the remotest parts of England. And, as I have heard also, the nobility and the gentry in all parts of England took the deplorable condition of the city into their consideration, and sent up large sums of money in charity to the Lord Mayor and the magistrates for the relief of the poor. The king also, as I was told, ordered a thousand pounds a week to be distributed in four parts, one quarter to the city and liberty of Westminster, one quarter or part among the inhabitants of the southwark side of the water, one quarter to the liberty and parts within of the city, exclusive of the city within the walls, and one fourth part to the suburbs in the county of Middlesex and the east and north parts of the city. But this latter I only speak of as a report. Certain it is the greatest part of the poor, or families who formerly lived by their labor, or by retail trade, lived now on charity, and had there not been prodigious sums of money given by charitable, well-minded Christians for the support of such, the city could never have subsisted. There were, no question, accounts kept of their charity, and of the just distribution of it by the magistrates, but as such multitudes of those very officers died through whose hands it was distributed, and also that, as I have been told, most of the accounts of those things were lost in the great fire which happened in the very next year, and which burnt even the Chamberlain's office and many of their papers. So I could never come at the particular account which I used great endeavours to have seen. It may, however, be a direction, in case of the approach of a like visitation, which God keep the city from. I say, it may be of use to observe that, by the care of the Lord Mayor and Aldermen, 
at that time in weekly distributing great sums of money for relief of the poor a multitude of people who would otherwise have perished were relieved and their lives preserved and here let me enter into a brief state of the case of the poor at that time and what way apprehended from them from whence may be judged hereafter what may be expected if the like distress should come upon the city at the beginning of the plague when there was now no more hope but that the whole city would be visited when as i have said all that had friends or estates in the country retired with their families and when indeed one would have thought the very city itself was running out of the gates and that there would be nobody left behind you may be sure from that hour all trade except such as related to immediate subsistence was as it were at a full stop this is so lively a case and contains in it so much of the real condition of the people that i think i cannot be too particular in it and therefore i descend to the several arrangements or classes of people who fell into immediate distress upon this occasion for example one all master workmen in manufactures especially such as belong to ornament and the less necessary part of the people's dress clothes and furniture for houses such as ribbond weavers and other weavers gold and silver lace makers and gold and silver wire drawers seamstresses milliners shoemakers hat makers and glove makers also upholsterers joiners cabinet makers looking glass makers and innumerable trades which depend upon such as these i say the master workmen in such stopped their work dismissed their journeymen and workmen and all their dependents two as merchandising was at a full stop for very few ships ventured to come up the river and none at all went out so all the extraordinary officers of the customs likewise the watermen carmen porters and all the poor whose labor depended upon the merchants were at once dismissed and put out of business three all the tradesmen usually employed in building or repairing of houses were at a full stop for the people were far from wanting to build houses when so many thousand houses were at once stripped of their inhabitants so that this one article turned all the ordinary workmen of that kind out of business such as bricklayers masons carpenters joiners plasterers painters glaziers smiths plumbers and all the laborers depending on such for as navigation was at a stop our ships neither coming in or going out as before so the seamen were all out of employment and many of them in the last and lowest degree of distress and with the seamen were all the several tradesmen and workmen belonging to and depending upon the building and fitting out of ships such as ship carpenters caulkers rope makers dry coopers sail makers anchor smiths and other smiths block makers carvers gunsmiths ship chandlers ship carvers and the like the masters of those perhaps might live upon their substance but the traders were universally at a stop and consequently all their workmen discharged add to these that the river was in a manner without boats and all or most part of the watermen lightermen boat builders and lighter builders in like manner idle and laid by five all families retrenched their living as much as possible as well those that fled as those that stayed so that an innumerable multitude of footmen serving men shopkeepers journeymen 
merchants, bookkeepers, and such sort of people, and especially poor maidservants, were turned off, and left friendless and helpless, without employment and without habitation, and this was really a dismal article. I might be more particular as to this part, but it may suffice to mention in general, all trades being stopped, employment ceased, the labor, and by that, the bread of the poor were cut off, and at first, indeed, the cries of the poor were most lamentable to hear, though, by the distribution of charity, their misery that way was greatly abated. Many, indeed, fled into the counties, but thousands of them, having stayed in London till nothing but desperation sent them away, death overtook them on the road, and they served for no better than the messengers of death. Indeed, others carrying the infection along with them spread it very unhappily into the remotest parts of the kingdom. Many of these were the miserable objects of despair which I have mentioned before, and were removed by the destruction which followed. These might be said to perish not by the infection itself, but by the consequence of it. Indeed, namely, by hunger and distress, and the want of all things, being without lodging, without money, without friends, without means to get their bread, or without any one to give it them. For many of them were without what we call legal settlements, and so could not claim of the parishes, and all the support they had was by application to the magistrates for relief, which relief was to give the magistrates their due, carefully and cheerfully administered as they found it necessary, and those that stayed behind never felt the want and distress of that kind which they felt who went away, in the manner above noted. Let any one who is acquainted with what multitudes of people get their daily bread in this city by their labor, whether artificers or mere workmen, I say, let any man consider what must be the miserable condition of this town, if, on a sudden, they should be all turned out of employment, that labor should cease, and wages for work be no more. This was the case with us at that time, and had not the sums of money contributed in charity by well-disposed people of every kind, as well abroad as at home, been prodigiously great, it had not been in the power of the Lord Mayor and Sheriffs to have kept the public peace. Nor were they without apprehensions, as it was, that desperation should push the people upon tumults, and cause them to rifle the houses of rich men, and plunder the markets of provisions, in which case the country people, who brought provisions very freely and boldly to town, would have been terrified from coming any more, and the town would have sunk under an unavoidable famine. But the prudence of my Lord Mayor and the Court of Aldermen within the city, and of the Justices of the Peace in the outparts, was such, and they were supported with money from all parts so well, that the poor people were kept quiet, and their wants everywhere relieved, as far it was possible to be done. Two things besides this contributed to prevent the mob doing any mischief. One was that, really, the rich themselves had not laid up stores of provisions in their houses, as indeed they ought to have done and which, if they had been wise enough to have done, and locked themselves entirely up, as some few did, they had perhaps escaped the disease better. But, as it appeared, they had not, so the mob had no notion of finding stores of provisions there, 
if they had broken in, as it is plain, they were sometimes very near doing, and which, if they had, they had finished the ruin of the whole city. For there were no regular troops to have withstood them, nor could the trained bands have been brought together to defend the city, no men being to be found to bear arms. But the vigilance of the Lord Mayor and such magistrates as could be had, for some, even of the aldermen, were dead and some absent, prevented this, and they did it by the most kind and gentle methods they could think of, as particularly by relieving the most desperate with money, and putting others into business, and particularly that employment of watching houses that were infected and shut up. And as the number of these were very great, for it was said, there was at one time ten thousand houses shut up, and every house had two watchmen to guard it, viz. one by night and the other by day. This gave opportunity to employ a very great number of poor men at a time. The women and servants that were turned off from their places were likewise employed as nurses to tend the sick in all places, and this took off a very great number of them, and, which though a melancholy article in itself, yet was a deliverance in its kind, namely the plague, which raged in a dreadful manner from the middle of August to the middle of October, carried off in that time thirty or forty thousand of these very people, which, had they been left, would certainly have been an insufferable burden by their poverty. That is to say, the whole city could not have supported the expense of them, or have provided food for them, and they would in time have been even driven to the necessity of plundering either the city itself or the country adjacent, to have subsisted themselves, which would first or last have put the whole nation, as well as the city, into the utmost terror and confusion. End of section 9 From a Journal of the Plague Year. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dennis Sayers. A Journal of the Plague Year by Daniel Defoe. Section 10. It was observable then that this calamity of the people made them very humble. For now, for about nine weeks together, there died near a thousand a day, one day with another, even by the account of the weekly bills, which yet, I have reason to be assured, never gave a full account by many thousands, the confusion being such, and the carts working in the dark when they carried the dead, that in some places no account at all was kept, but they worked on, the clerks and sextons not attending for weeks together, and not knowing what number they carried. This account is verified by the following bills of mortality. August 8th to August 15th, of all diseases, 5,319, of the plague, 3,000. 880. August 15th to August 22nd. Of all diseases, 5,568. Of the plague, 4,237. From August 22nd to August 29th, 7,496 of all diseases. Of the plague, 6,102. August 29th to September 5th, 
8,252 of all diseases, of the plague, 6,988. September 5th to September 12th, 7,690 of all diseases, of the plague, 6,544. September 12th to September 19th, 8,297 of all diseases, of the plague, 7,165. September 19th through September 26th, 6,460 of all diseases, of the plague, 5,533. September 26th to October 3rd, 5,720 of all diseases, of the plague, 4,979. October 3rd to October 10th, 5,068 of all diseases, of the plague, 4,327. Total of all diseases, 59,870 of the plague, 49,705, so that the gross of the people were carried off in these two months. For as the whole number which was brought in to die of the plague was but 68,590, here is 50,000 of them within a trifle, in two months. I say 50,000 because as there wants 395 in the number above, so there wants two days of two months in the account of time. Now when I say that the parish officers did not give in a full account, or were not to be depended upon for their account, let any one consider how men could be exact in such a time of dreadful distress, and when many of them were taken sick themselves, and perhaps died in the very time when their accounts were to be given in. I mean the parish clerks, besides inferior officers. For though these poor men ventured at all hazards, yet they were far from being exempt from the common calamity, especially if it be true that the parish of Stepney had within the year one hundred and sixteen sextons, grave-diggers, and their assistants, that is to say, bearers, bellmen, and drivers of carts, for carrying off the dead bodies. Indeed, the work was not of such a nature as to allow them leisure to take an exact tale of the dead bodies, which were all huddled together in the dark, into a pit, which pit, or trench, no man could come nigh but at the utmost peril. I have observed often that in the parishes of Aldgate, Cripplegate, Whitechapel, and Stepney, there were five, six, seven, and eight hundred in a week in the bills, whereas, if we may believe the opinion of those that lived in the city all the time, as well as I, there died sometimes two thousand a week in those parishes. And I saw it under the hand of one that made as strict an examination in that part as he could, that there really died a hundred thousand people of the plague in that one year. Whereas in the bills, the articles of the plague, it was but sixty-eight thousand five hundred and ninety. If I may be allowed to give my opinion, by what I saw with my eyes, and heard from other people that were eyewitnesses, I do verily believe the same. That is, that there died at least a hundred thousand of the plague only, besides other distempers, and besides those which died in the fields, and highways, and secret places, out of the compass of the communication, as it was called, and who were not put down in the bills, though they really belonged to the body of the inhabitants. It was known to us all that abundance of poor despairing creatures who had the distemper upon them, and were grown stupid or melancholy by their misery, as many were, wandered away into the fields and woods, and into secret, uncouth places, 
almost anywhere, to creep into a bush or hedge and die. The inhabitants of the village adjacent would, in pity, carry them food, and set it at a distance, that they might fetch it if they were able, and sometimes they were not able, and the next time they went they would find the poor wretches lie dead, and the food untouched. The number of these miserable objects were many, and I know so many perished thus, and so exactly where, that I believe I could go to the very place, and dig their bones up still. For the country people would go and dig a hole at a distance from them, and then, with long poles and hooks at the end of them, drag the bodies into these pits, and then throw the earth in from as far as they could cast it, to cover them, taking notice how the wind blew, and so come on that side which the seamen call to windward, that the scent of the bodies might blow from them. And thus great numbers went out of the world, who were never known, or any account of them taken, as well within the bills of mortality, as without. This, indeed, I had in the main only from the relation of others, for I seldom walked into the fields, except towards Bethnal Green and Hackney, or as hereafter. But when I did walk, I always saw a great many poor wanderers at a distance, but I could know little of their cases, for whether it were in the street or in the fields, if we had seen anybody coming, it was a general method to walk away. Yet I believe the account is exactly true. As this puts me upon mentioning my walking the streets and fields, I cannot omit taking notice what a desolate place the city was at that time. The great street I lived in, which is known to be one of the broadest of all the streets of London, I mean of the suburbs as well as the liberties, all the side where the butchers lived, especially without the bars, was more like a green field than a paved street, and the people generally went in the middle with the horses and carts. It is true that the farthest end, towards Whitechapel Church, was not all paved, but even the part that was paved was full of grass also. But this need not seem strange, since the great streets within the city, such as Leadenhall Street, Bishopsgate Street, Cornhill, and even the Exchange itself, had grass growing in them in several places, Neither cart nor coach was seen in the streets from morning to evening, except some country carts to bring roots and beans, or peas, hay, and straw to the market, and those but very few compared to what was usual. As for the coaches, they were scarce used, but to carry sick people to the pest house and to other hospitals, and some few to carry physicians to such places as they thought fit to venture to visit. For really, coaches were dangerous things, and people did not care to venture into them, because they did not know who might have been carried in them last, and sick, infected people were, as I have said, ordinarily carried in them to the pest houses, and sometimes people expired in them as they went along. It is true, when the infection came to such a height as I have now mentioned, there were very few physicians who cared to stir abroad to sick houses, and very many of the most eminent of the faculty were dead, as well as the surgeons also. For now it was indeed a dismal time, and for about a month together, not taking any notice of the bills of mortality, I believe there did not die less than fifteen or seventeen hundred a day, one day with another. One of the worst days we had in the whole time, as I thought, was in the beginning of September, when, indeed, good people were beginning to think that God was resolved to make a full end of the people in this miserable city. 
This was at the time when the plague was fully come into the eastern parishes. The parish of Aldgate, if I may give my opinion, buried above one thousand a week for two weeks, though the bills did not say so many. But it surrounded me, at so dismal a rate, that there was not a house in twenty uninfected. In the minories, in Houndsditch, and in those parts of the Aldgate parish, about the butcher row, and the alleys over against me, I say, in those places, death reigned in every corner. Whitechapel parish was in the same condition, and though much less than the parish I lived in, yet buried near six hundred a week by the bills, and in my opinion, near twice as many. Whole families, and indeed whole streets of families, were swept away together, insomuch that it was frequent for neighbours to call to the bellmen to go to such and such houses, and fetch out the people, for that they were all dead. And, indeed, the work of removing the dead bodies by carts was now grown so very odious and dangerous, that it was complained of that the bearers did not take care to clear such houses where all the inhabitants were dead, but that sometimes the bodies lay till the neighbouring families were offended by the stench, and consequently infected. And this neglect of the officers was such that the church wardens and constables were summoned to look after it, and even the justices of the hamlets were obliged to venture their lives among them to quicken and encourage them, for innumerable of the bearers died of the distemper, infected by the bodies they were obliged to come so near. And had it not been that the number of poor people who wanted employment, and wanted bread, as I have said before, was so great that necessity drove them to undertake anything, and venture anything, they would never have found people to be employed and then the bodies of the dead would have lain above ground, and have perished and rotted in a dreadful manner. But the magistrates cannot be enough commended in this, that they kept such good order for the burying of the dead, that as fast as any of those they employed to carry off and bury the dead fell sick or died, as was many times the case, they immediately supplied the places with others, which, by reason of the great number of poor that was left out of business, as above, was not hard to do. This occasioned that, notwithstanding the infinite number of people which died, and were sick, almost all together, yet they were always cleared away, and carried off every night, so that it was never to be said of London that the living were not able to bury the dead. As the desolation was greater during those terrible times, so the amazement of the people increased, and a thousand unaccountable things they would do in the violence of their fright, as others did the same in the agonies of their distemper, and this part was very affecting. Some went roaring and crying and wringing their hands along the street, some would go praying, and lifting up their hands to heaven, calling upon God for mercy. I cannot say, indeed, whether this was not in their distraction, but, be it so, it was still an indication of a more serious mind when they had the use of their senses, and was much better, even as it was, than the frightful yellings and cryings that every day, and especially, in the evenings, were heard in some streets. I suppose the world has heard of the famous Solomon Eagle, an enthusiast. He, though not infected at all, but in his head, went about denouncing of judgment upon the city in a frightful manner, sometimes quite naked, and with a pan of burning charcoal on his head. What he said, or pretended, indeed, I could not learn. I will not say whether that clergyman was distracted or not, 
or whether he did it out of pure zeal for the poor people, who went every evening through the streets of Whitechapel, and with his hands lifted up, repeated that part of the liturgy of the church continually. Quote, Spare us, good Lord, spare thy people whom thou hast redeemed with thy most precious blood. Close quote. I say, I cannot speak positively of these things, because these were only the dismal objects which represented themselves to me as I looked through my chamber windows, for I seldom opened the casements, while I confined myself within doors during the most violent raging of the pestilence, when indeed, as I have said, many began to think, and even to say, that there would none escape. And indeed, I began to think so too, and therefore kept within doors for about a fortnight, and never stirred out. But I could not hold it. Besides, there were some people who, notwithstanding the danger, did not omit publicly to attend the worship of God, even in the most dangerous times. And though it is true that a great many of the clergy did shut up their churches and fled, as other people did, for the safety of their lives, yet all did not do so. Some ventured to officiate, and to keep up the assemblies of the people by constant prayers, and sometimes sermons or brief exhortations to repentance and reformation, and this as long as any would come to hear them. And dissenters did the like also, and even in the very churches where the parish ministers were either dead or fled, nor was there any room for making difference at such a time as this was. It was indeed a lamentable thing to hear the miserable lamentations of poor dying creatures, calling out for ministers to comfort them and pray with them, to counsel them and direct them, calling out to God for pardon and mercy, and confessing aloud their past sins. It would make the stoutest heart bleed to hear how many warnings were then given by dying penitents to others not to put off and delay their repentance to the day of distress, that such a time of calamity as this was no time for repentance, was no time to call upon God. I wish I could repeat the very sound of those groans, and of those exclamations that I heard from some poor dying creatures, when in the height of their agonies and distress, and that I could make him that reads this hear as I imagine I now hear them, for the sound seems still to ring in my ears. If I could but tell this part in such moving accents as should alarm the very soul of the reader, I should rejoice that I recorded those things, however short and imperfect. It pleased God that I was still spared, and very hardy and sound in health, but very impatient of being pent up within doors without air as I had been for fourteen days, or thereabouts. And I could not restrain myself, but I would go out and carry a letter for my brother to the post-house, and then it was, indeed, that I observed a profound silence in the streets. When I came to the post-house, as I went to put in my letter, I saw a man stand in one corner of the yard, and talking to another at a window and a third had opened a door belonging to the office. In the middle of the yard lay a small leather purse, with two keys hanging at it, with money in it, but nobody would meddle with it. I asked how long it had lain there. The man at the window said it had lain almost an hour, but they had not meddled with it, because they did not know but the person who dropped it might come back to look for it. I had no such need of money, nor was the sum so big that I had any inclination to meddle with it, or to get the money at the hazard it might be attended with. So I seemed to go away, when the man who had opened the door said 
he would take it up, but so that, if the right owner came for it, he should be sure to have it. So he went in and fetched a pail of water, and set it down hard by the purse, then went again and fetched some gunpowder, and cast a good deal of powder upon the purse, and then made a train from that which he had thrown loose upon the purse, the train reached about two yards. After this he goes in a third time, and fetches out a pair of tongs, red-hot, which he had prepared, I suppose, on purpose, and first setting fire to the train of powder that sent the purse, and also smoked the air sufficiently. But he was not content with that, but he then takes up the purse with the tongs, holding it so long that the tongs burnt through the purse, and then he shook the money out into the pail of water. So he carried it in. The money, as I remember, was about thirteen shillings, and some smooth groats and brass farthings. End of Section 10eleven from a journal of the plague year this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox dot org a journal of the plague year by daniel defoe section eleven much about the same time I walked out into the fields towards Bow, for I had a great mind to see how things were managed in the river and among the ships, and, as I had some concern in shipping, I had a notion that it had been one of the best ways of securing oneself from the infection to have retired into a ship, and, musing how to satisfy my curiosity in that point, I turned away over the fields from Bow to Bromley, and down to Blackwall, to the stairs that are there for landing, or taking water. Here I saw a poor man walking on the bank, or sea-wall, as they call it, by himself. I walked a while also about, seeing the houses all shut up. At last I fell into some talk, at a distance, with this poor man. First I asked how people did thereabouts. Alas, sir, says he, almost desolate, all dead or sick. Here are very few families in this part, or in that village, pointing at Poplar, where half of them are not dead already, and the rest sick. Then he, pointing to one house, There, they are all dead, said he, and the house stands open. Nobody dares go into it. A poor thief, says he, ventured in to steal something, but he paid dear for his theft, for he was carried to the churchyard too, last night. Then he pointed to several other houses. There, says he, they are all dead, the man and his wife and five children. There, says he, they are shut up. You see a watchman at the door and so of other houses. Why, says I, what do you do here, all alone? Why, says he, I am a poor desolate man. It hath pleased God I am not yet visited, though my family is, and one of my children, dead. How do you mean, then, said I, that you are not visited? Why, says he, that is my house, pointing to a very little low-boarded house. And there my poor wife and two children live, said he, if they may be said to live, for my wife and one of the children are visited. But I do not come at them. And with that word I saw the tears run very plentifully down his face. And so they did down mine too, I assure you. But, said I, why do you not come at them? How can you abandon your own flesh and blood? Oh, sir, says he, the Lord forbid. I do not abandon them. I work for them as much as I am able, 
and blessed be the Lord, I keep them from want. And with that I observed he lifted up his eyes to heaven, with a countenance that presently told me I had happened on a man that was no hypocrite, but a serious, religious, good man. And his ejaculation was an expression of thankfulness, that, in such a condition as he was in, he should be able to say his family did not want. Well, says I, honest man, that is a great mercy, as things go now with the poor. But how do you live, then, and how are you kept from the dreadful calamity that is now upon us all? Why, sir, says he, I am a waterman, and there is my boat, says he, and the boat serves me for a house. I work in it in the day, and I sleep in it in the night, and what I get I lay it down upon that stone, says he, showing me a broad stone on the other side of the street, a good way from his house. And then, says he, I hallo, and call to them till I make them hear, and they come and fetch it. Well, friend, says I, but how can you get money as a waterman? Does anybody go by water these times? Yes, sir, says he. In the way I'm employed there does. Do you see there, says he, five ships lie at anchor, pointing down the river a good way below the town. And do you see, says he, eight or ten ships lie at the chain there, and at anchor yonder, pointing above the town. All those ships have families on board, of their merchants and owners and such like, who have locked themselves up and live on board, close shut in, for fear of the infection. And I tend on them to fetch things for them, carry letters, and do what is absolutely necessary, that they may not be obliged to come on shore. And every night I fasten my boat on board one of the ship's boats, and there I sleep by myself, and, blessed be God, I am preserved hitherto. Well, said I, friend, but will they let you come on board after you have been on shore here, when this is such a terrible place, and so infected as it is? Why, as to that, said he, I very seldom go up the ship's side, but deliver what I bring to their boat, or lie by the side, and they hoist it on board. If I did, I think they are in no danger from me, for I never go into any house on shore, or touch anybody. No, not my own family, but I fetch provisions for them. Nay, says I, but that may be worse, for you must have those provisions of somebody or other, and since all this part of the town is so infected, it is dangerous so much as to speak with anybody, for the village, said I, is, as it were, the beginning of London, though it be at some distance from it. That is true, added he, but you do not understand me right. I do not buy provisions for them here. I row up to Greenwich, and buy fresh meat there, and sometimes I row down the river to Woolwich, and buy there. Then I go to single farmhouses on the Kentish side, where I am known, and buy fowls and eggs and butter, and bring to the ships as they direct me, sometimes one, sometimes the other. I seldom come on shore here. I came only now to call my wife, and hear how my little family do, and give them a little money, which I received last night. Poor man, said I, and how much hast thou gotten for them? I have gotten four shillings, said he, which is a great sum, as things go now with poor men. But they have given me a bag of bread, too, and a salt fish, and some flesh, so all helps out. Well, said I, and have you given it them yet? No, said he, but I have called, and my wife has answered that she cannot come out yet, 
but in half an hour she hopes to come, and I am waiting for her. Poor woman, says he, she is brought sadly down, she has a swelling, and it is broke, and I hope she will recover, but I fear the child will die. But it is the Lord. Here he stopped, and wept very much. Well, honest friend, said I, thou hast a sure comforter, if thou hast brought thyself to be resigned to the will of God. He is dealing with us all in judgment. Oh, sir, says he, it is infinite mercy if any of us are spared, and who am I to repine? Sayest thou so, said I, and how much less is my faith than thine? And here my heart smote me, suggesting how much better this poor man's foundation was, on which he stayed in the danger, than mine, that he had nowhere to fly, that he had a family to bind him to attendance, which I had not, and mine was mere presumption, his a true dependence and a courage resting on God, and yet that he used all possible caution for his safety. I turned a little away from the man while these thoughts engaged me, for indeed I could no more refrain from tears than he. At length, after some further talk, the poor woman opened the door and called, Robert! Robert! He answered, and bid her stay a few moments, and he would come. So he ran down the common stairs to his boat, and fetched up a sack, in which was the provisions he had brought from the ships, and when he returned he hallowed again. Then he went to the great stone which he showed me, and emptied the sack, and laid all out, everything by themselves, and then retired and his wife came with a little boy to fetch them away. And he called and said, Such a captain had sent such a thing, and such a captain such a thing, and at the end adds, God has sent it all. Give thanks to him. When the poor woman had taken up all, she was so weak she could not carry it at once in, though the weight was not much, neither. So she left the biscuit, which was in a little bag, and left the little boy to watch it till she came again. Well, but, says I to him, did you leave her the four shillings, too, which you said was your week's pay? Yes, yes, says he, you shall hear her own it. So he called again, Rachel, Rachel, which it seems was her name. Did you take up the money? Yes, said she. How much was it? Four shillings and a groat, says she. Well, well, says he. The Lord keep you all. And so he turned to go away. As I could not refrain from contributing tears to this man's story, so neither could I refrain my charity for his assistance. So I called him. Hark thee, friend, said I. Come hither. For I believe thou art in health, that I may venture thee. So I put out my hand, which was in my pocket before. Here, says I, go and call thy Rachel once more, and give her a little more comfort from me. God will never forsake a family that trusts in him, as thou dost. So I gave him four other shillings, and bid him go lay them on the stone, and call his wife. I have not words to express the poor man's thankfulness. Neither could he express it himself but by tears running down his face. He called his wife and told her God had moved the heart of a stranger upon hearing their condition to give them all that money and a great deal more such as that he said to her. The woman, too, made signs of the like thankfulness as well as to heaven as to me and joyfully picked it up, and I parted with no money all that year that I thought better bestowed.
I then asked the poor man if the distemper had not reached to Greenwich. He said it had not till about a fortnight before, but that then he feared it had, but that it was only at that end of the town which lay south towards Deptford Bridge, that he went only to a butcher's shop and a grocer's, where he generally bought such things as they sent him for, but was very careful. I asked him then how it came to pass that those people who had so shut themselves up in the ships had not laid in sufficient stores of all things necessary. He said some of them had, but, on the other hand, some did not come on board till they were frightened into it, and till it was too dangerous for them to go to the proper people to lay in quantities of things, and that he waited on two ships, which he showed me, that had laid in little or nothing but biscuit-bread and ship-beer, and that he had bought everything else, almost, for them. I asked him if there were any more ships that had separated themselves as those had done. He told me, yes, all the way up the point, right against Greenwich, to within the shores of Limehouse and Redriff, all the ships that could have room, rid two and two in the middle of the stream, and that some of them had several families on board. I asked him if the distemper had not reached them. He said he believed it had not, except two or three ships, whose people had not been so watchful as to keep the seamen from going on shore as others had been, and he said it was a very fine sight to see how the ships lay up the pool. When he said he was going over to Greenwich as soon as the tide began to come in, I asked if he would let me go with him and bring me back, for that I had a great mind to see how the ships were ranged, as he had told me. He told me, if I would assure him on the word of a Christian and an honest man that I had not the distemper, he would. I assured him that I had not that it had pleased God to preserve me, that I lived in Whitechapel, but was too impatient of being so long within doors, and that I had ventured out so far for the refreshment of a little air, but that none in my house had so much as been touched with it. Well, sir, says he, as your charity has been moved to pity me and my poor family, sure, you cannot have so little pity left as to put yourself into my boat if you were not in sound health, which would be nothing less than killing me and ruining my whole family. The poor man troubled me so much when he spoke of his family with such a sensible concern and in such an affectionate manner that I could not satisfy myself at first to go at all, I told him I would lay aside my curiosity, rather than make him uneasy, though I was sure, and very thankful for it, that I had no more distemper upon me than the freshest man in the world. Well, he would not have me put it off neither, but to let me see how confident he was that I was just to him, he now importuned me to go. So, when the tide came up to his boat, I went in, and he carried me to Greenwich. While he bought the things which he had in charge to buy, I walked up to the top of the hill, under which the town stands, and on the east side of the town, to get a prospect of the river. But it was a surprising sight to see the number of ships which lay in rows, two and two, and in some places two or three such lines, in the breadth of the river, and this is not only up to the town, between the houses which we call Ratcliffe and Redriff, which they name the Pool, but even down the whole river, as far as the head of Long Reach, which is as far as the hills give us leave to see it. I cannot guess at the number of ships, but I think there must have been several hundreds of sail, and I could not but applaud the contrivance for ten thousand people and more 
who attended ship affairs were certainly sheltered here from the violence of the contagion and lived very safe and very easy i returned to my own dwelling very well satisfied with my day's journey and particularly with the poor man also i rejoiced to see that such little sanctuaries were provided for so many families in a time of such desolation i observed also that as the violence of the plague had increased so the ships which had the families on board removed and went farther off till as i was told some went quite away to sea and put into such harbours and safe roads on the north coast as they could best come at but it was also true that all the people who thus left the land and lived on board the ships were not entirely safe from the infection for many died and were thrown overboard into the river some in coffins and some as i heard without coffins whose bodies were seen sometimes to drive up and down with the tide in the river but i believe i may venture to say that in those ships which were thus infected it either happened where the people had recourse to them too late and did not fly to the ship till they had stayed too long on shore and had the distemper upon them though perhaps they might not perceive it and so the distemper did not come to them on board the ships but they really carried it with them for it was in the ships where the poor watermen said they had not had time to furnish themselves with provisions but were obliged to send often on shore to buy what they had occasion for or suffered boats to come to them from the shore and so the distemper was brought insensibly among them and here i cannot but take notice that the strange temper of the people of london at that time contributed extremely to their own destruction the plague began as i have observed at the other end of the town namely in longacre drury lane etc and came on towards the city very gradually and slowly it was felt at first in december then again in february then again in april and always but a very little at a time then it stopped till may and even the last week in may there were but seventeen in all that end of the town and all this while even so long as till there died above three thousand a week yet had the people in redriff and in wapping and ratcliffe on both sides of the river and almost all southern side a mighty fancy that they should not be visited or at least that it would not be so violent among them some people fancied the smell of the pitch and tar and such other things as oil and rosin and brimstone which is much used by all trades relating to shipping would preserve them others argued it because it was in its extremest violence in westminster and the parish of st giles in st andrew and began to abate again before it came among them which was true indeed in part for example august eighth to august fifteenth st giles in the fields two hundred and forty two cripplegate eight hundred and eighty six stepney one hundred and ninety seven st margaret bermondsey twenty four rotherhithe three for a total this week of four thousand thirty august fifteenth to august twenty second st giles in the fields one hundred and seventy five cripplegate eight hundred and forty seven stepney two hundred and seventy three st margaret bermondsey thirty six rather high two total this week five thousand three hundred and nineteen nota bene 
that it was observed that the numbers mentioned in stepney parish at that time were generally all on that side where stepney parish joined to shoreditch which we now call spitalfields where the parish of stepney comes up to the very wall of shoreditch churchyard and the plague at this time was abated at St. Giles in the fields, and raged most violently in Cripplegate, Bishopsgate, and Shoreditch parishes. But there were not ten people a week that died of it in all that part of Stepney Parish, which takes in Limehouse, Radcliffe Highway, and which are now the parishes of Shadwell and Wapping. Even to St. Catherine's by the Tower, till after the whole month of August was expired, but they paid for it afterwards, as I shall observe by and by. This, I say, made the people of Redriff and Wapping, Radcliffe and Limehouse, so secure, and flattered themselves so much with the plagues going off without reaching them, that they took no care either to fly into the country or shut themselves up, nay so far were they from stirring that they rather received their friends and relations from the city into their houses and several from other places really took sanctuary in that part of the town as a place of safety and as a place which they thought god would pass over and not visit as the rest was visited and this was the reason that when it came upon them they were more surprised, more unprovided, and more at a loss what to do, than they were in other places. For when it came among them really, and with violence, as it did indeed in September and October, there was then no stirring out into the country. Nobody would suffer a stranger to come near them, no, nor near the towns where they dwelt and, as I have been told, several that wandered into the country on the Surrey side were found starved to death in the woods and commons, that country being more open and more woody than any other part so near London, especially about Norwood and the parishes of Camberwell, Dulwich, and Lucem, where it seems nobody durst relieve the poor, distressed people, for fear of the infection. This notion having, as I said, prevailed with the people in that part of the town, was in part the occasion, as I said before, that they had recourse to ships for their retreat, and where they did this early, and with prudence, furnishing themselves so with provisions, that they had no need to go on shore for supplies, or suffer boats to come on board to bring them, I say, where they did so, they had certainly the safest retreat of any people whatsoever. But the distress was such, that people ran on board in their fright without bread to eat, and some into ships that had no men on board to remove them farther off, or to take the boat and go down the river to buy provisions, where it may be done safely. And these often suffered and were infected on board as much as on shore. As the richer sort got into ships, so the lower rank got into hoys, smacks, lighters, and fishing boats, and many, especially watermen, lay in their boats, but those made sad work of it, especially the latter, for going about for provision, and perhaps to get their subsistence, the infection got in among them, and made a fearful havoc. Many of the watermen died alone in their wherries, as they rid at their roads, as well above the bridge as below, and were not found sometimes, till they were not in condition for anybody to touch or come near them. Indeed, the distress of the people at this seafaring end of the town was very deplorable and deserved the greatest commiseration. But, alas, this was a time when every one's private safety lay so near them that they had no room to pity the distresses of others, for every one 
had death, as it were, at his door, and many even in their families, and knew not what to do, or whither to fly. End of section 11twelve of a journal of the plague year this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox dot org read by dennis sayers a journal of the plague year by daniel defoe section twelve this i say took away all compassion. Self-preservation, indeed, appear here to be the first law. For the children ran away from their parents, as they languished in the utmost distress, and in some places, though not so frequent as the other, parents did the like to their children. Nay, some dreadful examples there were, and particularly two in one week, of distressed mothers raving and distracted killing their own children one whereof was not far off from where i dwelt the poor lunatic creature not living herself long enough to be sensible of the sin of what she had done much less to be punished for it it is not indeed to be wondered at for the danger of immediate death to ourselves took away all bowels of love, all concern for one another. I speak in general, for there were many instances of immovable affection, pity, and duty in many, and some that came to my knowledge, that is to say, by hearsay, for I shall not take upon me to vouch the truth of the particulars. To introduce one, let me first mention that one of the most deplorable cases in all the present calamity was that of women with child, who, when they came to the hour of their sorrows, and their pains come upon them, could neither have help of one kind or another, neither midwife or neighbouring women, to come near them. Most of the midwives were dead, especially of such as served the poor and many, if not all the midwives of note, were fled into the country, so that it was next to impossible for a poor woman that could not pay an immoderate price to get any midwife to come to her, and, if they did, those they could get were generally unskilful and ignorant creatures, and the consequence of this was that a most unusual and incredible number of women were reduced to the utmost distress. Some were delivered and spoiled by the rashness and ignorance of those who pretended to lay them. Children without number were, I might say, murdered by the same, but a more justifiable ignorance. Pretending they would save the mother, whatever became of the child, and many times both mother and child were lost in the same manner and especially where the mother had the distemper, there nobody would come near them, and both sometimes perished. Sometimes the mother has died of the plague, and the infant, it may be, half-born, or born but not parted from the mother. Some died in the very pains of their travail, and not delivered at all. And so many were the cases of this kind, that it is hard to judge of them. Something of it will appear in the unusual numbers which are put into the weekly bills, though I am far from allowing them to be able to give anything of a full account, under the articles of Childbed, Abortive and Stillborn, Christmas and Infants. Take the weeks in which the plague was most violent, and compare them with the weeks before the distemper began, even in the same year from january third to january tenth childbed seven abortive one stillborn thirteen from january tenth to january seventeenth childbed eight 
abortive six, stillborn eleven. From January 17th to January 24th, childbed nine, abortive five, stillborn fifteen. From January 24th to January 31st, childbed three, abortive two, stillborn nine. From January 31st to February 7th, childbed three, abortive three, stillborn eight. From February 7th to February 14th, childbed six, abortive two, stillborn eleven. From February 14th to February 21st, childbed five, abortive two, stillborn thirteen. From February 21st to February 28th, childbed two, abortive two, stillborn ten. From February 28th to March 7th, childbed five, abortive one, stillborn ten. For a total, in this period, of childbed 48, abortive 24, stillborn one hundred. From August 1st to August 8th, childbed 25, abortive 5, stillborn 11. From August 8th to August 15th, childbed 23, abortive 6, stillborn 8. From August 15th to August 22nd, childbed 28, abortive 4, stillborn four from august twenty second through august twenty ninth childbed forty abortive six stillborn ten from august twenty ninth to september fifth childbed thirty eight abortive two stillborn eleven from september fifth through september twelfth childbed thirty nine Abortive, 23, stillborn unknown. From September 12th to September 19th, childbed, 42. Abortive, 5, stillborn, 17. From September 19th through September 26th, childbed, 42. Abortive, 6, stillborn, 10. And from September 26th to October 3rd, childbed 14, abortive 4, stillborn 9, for a total in this period of childbed 291, abortive 61, stillborn 80. To the disparity of these numbers, it is to be considered and allowed for that, according to our usual opinion, who were then upon the spot, there were not one-third of the people in the town during the months of August and September, as were in the months of January and February. In a word, the usual number that used to die of these three articles, and, as I hear, did die of them the year before, was thus. 1664. Childbed 189. 1665, childbed 625. 1664, abortive and stillborn 458. 1665, abortive and stillborn 617. 1664, total 647. 1665, total one thousand two hundred and forty two this inequality i say is exceedingly augmented when the numbers of people are considered i pretend not to make any exact calculation of the numbers of people which were at this time in the city but i shall make a probable conjecture at that part by and by what i have said now is to explain the misery of those poor creatures above so that it might well be said, as in the scripture, 
Woe be to those who are with child, and to those which give suck in that day, for indeed it was a woe to them in particular. I was not conversant in many particular families where these things happened, but the outcries of the miserable were heard afar off. As to those who were with child, we have seen some calculation made. Two hundred and ninety-one women dead in childbed in nine weeks, out of one-third part of the number of whom there usually died in that time, but eighty-four of the same disaster. Let the reader calculate the proportion. There is no room to doubt but the misery of those that gave suck was in proportion as great. Our bills of mortality could give but little light in this, yet some it did. There were several more than usual starved at nurse, but this was nothing. The misery was where they were, first, starved for want of a nurse, the mother dying and all the family and the infants found dead by them, merely for want. And, if I may speak my opinion, I do believe that many hundreds of poor helpless infants perished in this manner. Secondly, not starved, but poisoned by the nurse, nay, even where the mother has been the nurse, and having received the infection, has poisoned, that is, infected the infant with her milk, even before they knew they were infected themselves. Nay, and the infant has died in such a case before the mother. I cannot but remember to leave this admonition upon record, if ever such another dreadful visitation should happen in this city, that all women that are with child or that give suck should be gone, if they have any possible means, out of the place, because their misery, if infected, will so much exceed all other people's. I could tell here dismal stories of living infants being found sucking the breasts of their mothers or nurses after they have been dead of the plague, of a mother in the parish where I lived, who, having a child that was not well, sent for an apothecary to view the child, and when he came, as the relation goes, was giving the child suck at her breast, and to all appearance was herself very well. But when the apothecary came close to her, he saw the tokens upon that breast with which she was suckling the child. He was surprised enough, to be sure, but not willing to fright the poor woman too much, he desired she would give the child into his hand. So he takes the child, and going to a cradle in the room, lays it in, and opening its cloths, found the tokens upon the child too, and both died before he could get home to send a preventive medicine to the father of the child, to whom he had told their condition. Whether the child infected the nurse mother or the mother the child was not certain, but the last most likely. Likewise of a child brought home to the parents from a nurse that had died of the plague, yet the tender mother would not refuse to take in her child, and laid it in her bosom, by which she was infected, and died with the child in her arms dead also. It would make the hardest heart move at the instances that were frequently found of tender mothers tending and watching their dear children, and even dying before them, and sometimes taking the distemper from them and dying, when the child for whom the affectionate heart had been sacrificed has got over it and escaped. The like of a tradesman in East Smithfield, whose wife was big with child of her first child, and fell in labour, having the plague upon her. He could neither get midwife to assist her, or nurse to tend her, and two servants which he kept fled both from her. He ran from house to house like one distracted, but could get no help. The utmost he could get was that a watchman, who attended at an infected house shut up, promised to send a nurse in the morning. The poor man with his heart broke, went back, 
assisted his wife what he could, acted the part of the midwife, brought the child dead into the world, and his wife in about an hour died in his arms, where he held her dead body fast till the morning, when the watchman came and brought the nurse, as he had promised, and coming up the stairs, for he had left the door open, or only latched, they found the man sitting with his dead wife in his arms, and so overwhelmed with grief that he died in a few hours after, without any sign of the infection upon him, but merely sunk under the weight of his grief. I have heard also of some who, on the death of their relations, have grown stupid with the insupportable sorrow, and of one in particular, who was so absolutely overcome with the pressure upon his spirits, that by degrees his head sank into his body, so between his shoulders that the crown of his head was very little seen above the bone of his shoulders, and by degrees losing both voice and sense, his face, looking forward, lay against his collar-bone, and could not be kept up any otherwise unless held up by the hands of other people, and the poor man never came to himself again, but languished near a year in that condition, and died. Nor was he ever once seen to lift up his eyes, or to look upon any particular object. I cannot undertake to give any other than a summary of such passages as these, because it was not possible to come at the particulars, where sometimes the whole families, where such things happened, were carried off by the distemper. But there were innumerable cases of this kind, which presented to the eye and ear, even in the passing, along the streets, as I have hinted above. Nor is it easy to give any story of this or that family, which there was not diverse parallel stories to be met with of the same kind. But, as I am now talking of the time when the plague raged at the easternmost part of the town, how for a long time the people of those parts had flattered themselves that they should escape, and how they were surprised when it came upon them as it did. For, indeed, it came upon them like an armed man when it did come. I say, this brings me back to the three poor men who wandered from Wapping, not knowing whither to go, or what to do, and whom I mentioned before, one a biscuit-baker, one a sail-maker, and the other a joiner, all of Wapping or thereabouts. The sleepiness and security of that part, as I have observed, was such that they not only did not shift for themselves, as others did, but they boasted of being safe, and of safety being with them and many people fled out of the city, and out of the infected suburbs to Wapping, Ratcliffe, Limehouse, Poplar, and such places, as to places of security. And it is not at all unlikely that their doing this helped to bring the plague that way faster than it might otherwise have come. For though I am much for people flying away, and emptying such a town as this upon the first appearance of a like visitation, and that all people who have any possible retreat should make use of it in time and be gone. Yet, I must say, when all that will fly are gone, those who are left and must stand it should stand stock still where they are, and not shift from one end of the town or one part of the town to the other for that is the bane and mischief of the whole, and they carry the plague from house to house in their very clothes. Wherefore we were ordered to kill all the dogs and cats, but because as they were domestic animals, and are apt to run from house to house, and from street to street, so they are capable of carrying the effluvia, or infectious streams of bodies infected, even in their furs and hair, and therefore it was that in the beginning of the infection an order was published by the Lord Mayor, and by the magistrates, according to the advice of the physicians, that all the dogs and cats should be immediately killed, and an officer was appointed 
for the execution. It is incredible, if their account is to be depended upon, what a prodigious number of those creatures were destroyed. I think they talked of forty thousand dogs, and five times as many cats, few houses being without a cat, some having several, sometimes five or six, in a house. All possible endeavors were used also to destroy the mice and rats, especially the latter, by laying ratsbane and other poisons for them, and a prodigious multitude of them were also destroyed. I often reflected upon the unprovided condition that the whole body of the people were in at the first coming of this calamity upon them, and how it was for want of timely entering into measures and managements, as well public as private, that all the confusions that followed were brought upon us, and that such a prodigious number of people sank in that disaster, which if proper steps had been taken, might, providence concurring, have been avoided, and which, if posterity think fit, they may take a caution and warning from. But I shall come to this part again. End of section 12